Um, so that's my my collaborator, Lee Cronin, uh, is a chemist, uh, and he's totally brilliant. And actually, him and I are probably, uh, you know, I don't know, like what we're trying to do is, is a little bit crazy <laughs> um, to solve the origin of life. But, you know, like I hadn't uh, like he he's doing the experimental stuff. But like the, the sort of idea we had in mind is like, I'll write a book, try to get the ideas out there, get people excited about thinking about this space. And he'll start a company that will digitize chemistry and try to raise the funds to actually do the experiments. So he's trying to build the technology and the experiments. It's built on this platform he has for building robots that basically do the chemistry for you. And the idea being, if we could build a large enough experiment, we could search that huge space of chemistry, a little bit like a search algorithm for chemistry, and then be able to look in chemical space and try to discover aliens Whoa. in an origin life experiment on Earth. And so that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> um, Whoa. I'm really excited. I hope it happens. Imagine if you guys, if someone does something like this, maybe it's you, maybe it's someone else, someone does something like this and creates an artificial life form and then starts manipulating that life form and evolving that life form. Yes. Through That's some, the aim. some extraneous processes. Yeah. So, I mean, there are benefits to that, right? So, so Lee's company, Chemify, is a digital chemistry company, and their stated aim is to be able to 3D print any molecule on demand, right? So this has huge impact for the pharmaceutical industry, but like the real goal is to make an artificial life form in the lab. But that also has huge impact for humanity because you imagine that now you have the ability to study in this other system all of these other kinds of chemistries, like what can you do for like antibiotic discovery or um, pharmaceutical drug discovery or even psychedelic drug discovery if people like that. But, you know, like there's there's a crazy amount of new technology and new insights fundamentally to come out of that. But I also don't think that we're really going to understand these other kind of technologies that we're building like when we're thinking about artificial intelligence and like, is that alive or not? Unless we solve this chemical problem of what life is, because I think the chemical problem is much harder, but much more direct as far as like understanding the fundamental nature of life when you solve it in an experimental program. Biological life. Biological life. What? Chemical life. Because it won't, it won't be biology as we know it, right? right? That's the whole point. Right, that's It'll the be point. alien biology that we evolve in the lab. Right. And I actually think this is how we're going to make first contact with alien life because I think we won't recognize it unless we understand what it is. Wow. No, what ethical concerns would arise when you take a thing, like let's say, let's advance this, this whole process a few hundred years from now, mm -hmm. and you've created artificial life, you've created this thing that doesn't exist anywhere else, and then instead of it being subject to natural selection as a, a vehicle for it, it, its advancement, Instead, we just start fucking with it. Yeah. And then it gets to a point where there's an ethical concern, like, hey, this thing's about to get smarter than us. What do we do? I think there's ethical concerns right along the way. And I don't know that I know immediate answers to those. So, I, you know, it's kind of it, like this is the part where it's a little existentially traumatic to work on these kind of problems. So I have a friend that's a philosopher, Ben Bratton, and he says the best kind of like ideas are the ones that are like, equally like really exciting and horrifying mm. and like you want to work on those ideas because you don't know what it's like future is going to be and I tend to be on the optimistic side I think we need to solve this problem because I think we have this sort of existential crisis in some sense that humanity is facing because we don't understand what we are we don't understand what our technologies are doing we don't understand what our long-term future holds we don't even understand all the life around us on this planet so we solve that problem I think that the lens through which we will look at the kind of ethical things that you're talking about will be radically different because the knowledge itself will have transformed us. So I can't even anticipate what those kind of dialogues are going to be like. Mm. Imagine if like, instead of just wondering about cephalopods and plants and stuff in this conversation, we actually had a fundamental understanding of what it is to be other life forms and uh, life as a, uh, you know, as part of the fundamental structure of reality and like participatory in actually like what the universe builds. And you have that kind of understanding I, I think it radically changes the way that we conceptualize who we are and what we're doing. And I don't, you know, I don't know what that looks like. And we would assume that if we continue, especially down the path of AI and quantum computing, they are probably going to solve a lot of these problems. 
Yeah, I think we're flying blind in those areas, though, mm. really, especially AI. I mean, I think that that's pretty obvious that, you know, there's a huge amount of debate about the nature of intelligence in these artificial algorithms. I certainly think that they're life, but I think they're life in the sense that the lineage of information necessary to train a large language model, for example, you know, requires a planet to evolve something like us and evolve language and then enough data about that language to train the model. So it's a direct descendant, like you were saying, like, you know, our technology is our babies. Um, but, um, so there's that part of it, but I think, I don't know. I totally lost my train of thought. This is very funny. Um, <laughs> it went two ways and I don't know which way I want to go. Um, <laughs> that's very funny. Um, yeah. What was your question again? I'm so sorry. That's a good question. I don't remember <laughs> what my question was. So we're both in the same boat. The, the idea was, was like, that artificial intelligence would enhance our understanding of what it means to be biological. Oh, I see. And you were, yeah, and you were asking and about quantum information. Yeah. Yes, and that with when, yeah. when when computing power is massively increased and you have a sentient artificial intelligence that essentially has all the information that we have of every human being, all every right. database, everything all over the world, but yet far more capable of processing this and advancing yeah, these things that so, maybe it'll have a more of complex understanding of what life is. Yeah. So there the yeah. So I think I think there's like a sort of subtlety here when you're talking about artificial intelligence and whether it could compete with natural intelligence, right? So this is sort of the canonical debate about the nature of artificial intelligence. But I think I think we really underestimate what chemistry can do. And I think some of the most powerful computers on this planet are still chemical. And if we actually understand chemistry better, you know, with these kind of new digital chemistry technologies, the kind of compute we can get out of chemistry might actually outcompete silicon in the long run. Mm. Well, then there's also the concept of hybrids, right? Yes. When we comes hybrids. I like, I like, I like that concept, um, but this gets into the blurry area of like, are you human anymore? Like, if right. you if you have a chip in your brain and you're 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 like being a cephalopod and then you morph into like, yeah. you know, being you know, on your, your own desktop, like, are you still human? Well, that's what I always say about like if you go back to Australopithecus and explain to him airplanes and yeah. cell phones, but you can't be Australopithecus anymore. I'd be like, whoa, I don't want to stop being me. Yeah, you know, wouldn't that be the same reaction that they have? I think probably yeah. probably terrified. I don't yeah. want to, be able to become a person. I don't want to become an alien. No. I want to be some gray dude with a giant head and big black eyes. But maybe that's what we become. Yeah, I think also intergenerationally we're already doing that. So like the sort of you know people will always talk about how kids are more comfortable with technology than their parents or grandparents were. Oh yeah. And why are they more comfortable? Because they grew up in a totally different environment. Right. Like the world has literally changed in the last few decades. So mm -hmm. like the world that kids are growing up today is not the world that it was when kids are growing up like 50 years ago. Right. And so they are quote unquote alien, not really alien, but like they're they're really fundamentally different in in a lot of ways. And I think it's okay to recognize that. Like that's, you know, part of the progression of understanding and the fact that the world is changing. And